why don't you come forward for Squirrel World over here with me. We're going to have another storytelling time with our squirrels. So come on, you can just sit right on the floor here, and I will knock on the tree, and we'll get our squirrels to come on out and help us with today's lesson. So let me just, uh, usually I knock on the tree here, and one of them comes out here. Hello, guys? Ah! Oh, that always seems to happen. What? Uh, you, you know what, Ernie? I think you need to turn your voice on. Let's, let's see here if Ernie's uh, voice comes through now. Hey, Ernie. I'm here to help with today's story. Uh, you're here to help with today's story. But Ernie, you, uh, your, your uh, voice sounds a bit weird. And what do you guys think this is? A band-aid. A band -aid. It looks like your trunk has got a cast on it. What is going on? Oh, it's nothing. I just broke it sucking on one of those new grass-flavored trunk breakers I bought from Wally's mom. <sighs> Oh, hey, Ernie! I heard you broke your trunk on one of Mumsy's trunk breakers. That's so awesome! I know, right? You should have heard it when it snapped oh, yeah. in three places. Wow. It was totally cool. Man, I wish I had a trunk to break. Wait, 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 wait a minute, Ernie. You, you wanted to break your trunk? Of course you did. They're called trunk breakers. Pastor stuff. Yeah, I, I know, but I thought that was just the name of the candy. You mean you humans don't want to break your jaw when you suck on a jawbreaker? Uh, no, guys, when, when we eat jawbreakers, do we want to break our jaw? No, no, we don't. We definitely do not want to oh, break, hold, break hold, our jaw. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Ben, why do you call them jawbreakers? You should change your name instead of lying to people. Like, you should just call it, like, tongue twister or, like, lint buster or something. <laughs> Why, why would you want to call them that instead? Well, you just kind of lick on the candy, like, <laughs> until your tongue gets tired, and then you put it in your pocket for, like, a couple hours or a couple of days before you pick it up again and pick up all the lint in your pockets. <laughs> that, that just sounds completely disgusting. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure why you would want to do that. But, uh, no, we, we, we call them jawbreakers. It's just a name. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, Wally, how's hmm? Ricardo doing? Oh, pretty good. They say that he'll be able to go home in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. R Did you just say Ricardo? Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've never heard of Ricardo. Who's Ricardo? Who's Ricardo? As if you don't know, Pastor Steph. Yeah, you're the one who told us about him. Ricardo the Rhino Squirrel. Mm -hmm. Seriously, guys, I, I don't know who you're talking about. Have you guys ever heard of Ricardo the Rhino Squirrel? No, we have no idea who Ricardo the Rhino Squirrel is. See, the kids have. Of course you have. You told us about him a couple weeks ago and how he jumped out of an aeroplane without a parachute. Mm -hmm. And then you wouldn't tell us which hospital he was in, so Wally and I had to call every hospital in the Lower Mainland. We finally found him at Burnaby General. That was tough work. Yeah, but, but guys, I, I just completely made up that story as a parable. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't think Ricardo would appreciate being told that his injuries are just made up. Mm. Yeah, they are pretty real. Mm -hmm. We've been visiting him every day since we found him. We've been breaking him meals, reading him stories, and keeping him company. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know what, guys? Like, I mean, it's kind of weird that... Uh, that this is actually a true story because I was just making it up. But you know what? One of the things that's really neat is the fact that last week we talked about one of Jesus' parables called the Good Samaritan. It was all about being a good neighbor. And you know what? You guys are showing how to be good neighbors to Ricardo by going to the hospital and by reading him stories and by just hanging out with him. You guys are being really good neighbors. Yep. We just kind of apologize to Ricardo for you. Um, you apologize to Ricardo for me. Why, why would you do that? Because he said that I was watching one of your sermons about Jesus' parachutes, that he got the idea to jump out the plane. Yeah, we told him that you meant Jesus' parables, that you're not always clear when you talk. Wally, you just said parable. You <gasps> finally said the word right. You said parable. Oh. 
Good for you! Well, anyway, Ricardo says that he forgives you. Mm-hmm. But in the future, Pastor Steph, just work harder on your enunciation. If you spoke a little clearer, it could save lives. <sighs> well, thanks, guys. All right, let's pray, guys, and then you can go off to Sunday school. I mean, I'm pretty impressed that Wally finally said parable properly and not parachute and all the other weird words that he came up with. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that we can learn from your stories, and we can even learn how to be good neighbors. And we thank you, Jesus, that you've taught us in the Bible how to love people that are like us and even people that are different from us. So maybe we'll go off to Sunday school now and continue to learn about you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go. Well, yes, we are doing a sermon series right now through Jesus' parables and looking at these perplexing parables because so many of them often are, even the ones that we are familiar with, like the Good Samaritan that we talked about last week, are often perplexing because Jesus is getting through, through stories, points that throw our world upside down, but in many ways try to put our world right side up. Well, in today's story, right before Jesus tells it, he was reaching the absolute height of his popularity. Luke chapter 12 begins this way. It says, the crowds grew until thousands were milling around and stepping on each other. Crowds grew. Jesus was a rock star, at least in the minds of the people, in the minds of the crowd at this time. But, but Jesus knew better. He knew that the same crowds that quickly prop you up are sometimes the same crowds that can just as easily trample you down. And at this particular time, though, as the crowds were crowding in on Jesus, almost stepping over each other, we read that someone called out from the crowd and said, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now, you would think this was a perfectly reasonable request. Something obviously was going on that seemed unjust, and Jesus was all about justice. Jesus was all about truth. And it appears that this man was being taken advantage of by his brother. And so he comes and he asks Jesus for a very honest intervention. And this is something that rabbis would do all the time. And so this is even, isn't even unusual. Jesus would have been seen as a rabbi. There is some dispute going on in some family. And so this man calls out to the rabbi, one of the most popular rabbis of the day, and just says, Jesus... Please tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus then replies and says, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? I mean, it's a strange response. It's, it's a strange response for us, too, that even know the story of Jesus and know the story of Jesus post-resurrection. Because we would all say, well, of course Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the judge over all. So why the reluctance of Jesus to get involved in such a request of justice? And what did Jesus expect? I mean, Jesus had been going around and he'd been healing people. He'd been doing crazy things that really even ticked a lot of the religious leaders off when he was forgiving people of their sins. Do you remember the woman that was caught in adultery? And Jesus forgave her and said, go and sin no more. On other occasions when Jesus kept forgiving people of their sins, the religious leaders were saying, how can you do this? Only God himself can forgive sins. <clears throat> you can't go around like Jesus and claim to be the truth and to forgive people of their sins and claim to stand up for the truth. And then when someone comes and asks you a request like Jesus... There's truth that needs to go on in my family. 
My brother is not fairly dividing the inheritance between me and him. Jesus, speak truth into this situation. Do something, Jesus. For Jesus to all of a sudden respond by saying, why are you bothering me about this? I have nothing to do with this situation. Why are you getting me involved in this situation between you and your brother? It's like a brush off. The crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. And Jesus, at this point, had what every rock star desires. And his disciples, I mean, they were lapping up the benefits of being Jesus' roadies. But Jesus turned first to his disciples. And Jesus warned them, it says at the beginning of Luke chapter 12, the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known. In other words, what Jesus is saying is don't be enamored by the crowds and don't be captivated what appears to be a legitimate request. Chasing the praise of the crowds, trying to meet everybody's perceived needs will only leave you and the people that you are trying to meet empty. Use perception. A time is coming when secrets will be revealed. I remember something that happened back at my last church, there was a lady during the week that hobbled into our office area. She had a cane, it was all hunched over, and she hobbled in very slowly, and she was asking for some money and gave this story about how she needed the money for some different reasons. And so what we told her is that what our policy was at the church is we never just handed out money. It too often can be abused. And so we said we had a policy. We have some Walmart gift cards. And so we can take your name. We can take your information. And if you come back within 24 hours, you can have one of these Walmart gift cards. Well, she was absolutely upset with us and started swearing at us about how unchristian we were and how we didn't care about people. And on and on she went. And then she left and hobbled out of our office in this angry manner and I just watched her as she went across our parking lot and then when probably in her mind she felt she was out of our sight I all of a sudden saw her pick up her cane throw it on her shoulder and just walk away completely normal the sarcastic side of me wanted to run out after her and say praise the Lord you've been healed but I didn't do that because some of the other staff said, staff, just let, let it go. But not everything that is perceived or that comes across as a legitimate request is a legitimate request. Now, we don't know people's hearts, but Jesus does. Jesus knows what's going on underneath the surface. He knows our hearts even better than we know our own hearts. Jesus knew the heart of this man who was making this request even better than the man himself knew his own heart. And so when Jesus was asked, and when Jesus responded by saying, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Jesus was showing that he cared about this man more than the man even cared about himself. And he wanted to address something very important going on in this person's life, in this person's whole family situation. And so what Jesus does is he doesn't ignore the guy. He doesn't just brush him off and say, hey, who, why get me involved in this? What he does is he probes deeper he ends up saying beware guard against every kind of greed life is not measured by how much you own the man comes to jesus and said jesus get involved 
try to help this dispute. And Jesus ends up saying, hey, life is about more than how much you own. In fact, too much of a focus on that can ruin you. It's kind of like the person that goes in for marriage counseling and says, I need you to help fix my marriage. And the counselor says, okay, the first thing you need to do is forgive your father. Uh, That's what Jesus is doing. He's probing deeper. There's a surface need that this individual comes to Jesus with, but Jesus goes deeper and says, There's something more going on here than just the inheritance between you and your brother. There's something going on in your heart that needs to be dealt with. And now the man's faced with two options. He either has to begin to internalize what Jesus is saying, or he needs to go find a different counselor or a different rabbi to just affirm what he wants to hear. And then, as Jesus so often does in situations like this, he tells a story. This is the context. Remember, we've been talking about all these parables, and we say that they all fit into a situation, a context. They're not just random stories. Jesus tells them in a context. And he tells stories because stories draw in our whole being. Stories speak to our emotions and to our will. And not just to our minds. Stories call us to participate in the conclusion of them. Stories speak to our EQ as much and if not even more than our IQ. And so Jesus tells this man a story. In chapter 12 of Luke and verse 16, this is how the story goes. Jesus says, A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? Now, I don't have room for all my crops. And then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend... You have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. I love stories like this one. They have a kind of an Edgar Allan Poe feel to them. It's why I hang up medieval pictures of the dance of death who is holding a pastor's hand. It's this reminder that mortality and our mortality is always right around the corner. Or have screensavers on my computer with a skull on it that says, porn kills love. I mean, death can actually be a great ally to us in reminding us about what is important in life. It's why a lot of medieval scholars actually had a skull on their desk. So as they were writing their great tomes of philosophy or theology or whatever science they were working on, they were always reminded every time they looked at that skull that they were mortal. Death can be a good help in reminding us about what is most important. Jesus here is not against building bigger barns. Jesus is not against making more money. But Jesus does have a lot to say about money. And not only about what money and what we can do with it, but also Jesus has a lot to say about what money can do to us. I can't think of a stronger anti-retirement verse in the Bible than the one where the rich man says, I'll sit back and say to myself, My friend, 
You have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, that's an insane way to live. It even makes you go insane. As we see in this very story, we can see this in the farmer's habit of talking to himself as if he's two people. I mean, read the story. He starts talking to himself. I'll say, my friend, I mean, he's a bit creepy. He's a bit weird. He's talking to himself now. It reminds me of the Mr. Bean episode where he mails himself a Christmas card. He's his own friend. Living this way is a living death sentence. It makes you go crazy. You might as well buy yourself a copy of Dale Power's book, Do It Yourself Coffins. But God said to him, You fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? I've got a good guess at who will get everything that he worked for. His children. And guess what his children are going to do? They're going to fight over it. Okay, let's back up. Isn't that exactly the context of this whole story? What's going on? A guy comes to Jesus. He's fighting with his brother over his parents' inheritance and saying, tell my brother to divide it fairly with me. As a pastor, I have been in so many situations where I have walked with people and after some parent or someone has died in the family, I have seen the danger an inheritance can do to a family. Families that have been at least maybe on the surface, looking like they're all together and harmonized, all of a sudden when the parent or parents pass away, divide and fight and animosity and hatred begin to wedge themselves in because of an inheritance. Maybe the rich fool that Jesus was talking about in this story is actually this guy's father. Maybe he's referring to his own father. Is Jesus warning him? Don't be like your dad. Don't be like your dad who saved up everything he made, stuffed it into barns, only to give to you and your brother to fight over. Maybe this is why Jesus even addresses him gently by saying, my friend. Was Jesus giving dignity to a man raised by a father whose only real interest was money? and not the actual relationship and benefit to his own children. Money does a strange thing to us. There was a, a rich capitalist from the north who was horrified to find a southern fisherman who had caught just enough fish for the day for him to be satisfied, saw him lying in a hammock, stretched out, and just enjoying the sun. And as this capitalist came on by in his own boat, he looked at the fisherman and said, what are you doing? Why don't you catch more fish? To which the fisherman replied, I, I have enough. Uh, I, I have enough that I, I need for the day. But the capitalist said, but, but, but you could get more. You could get more fish. If you sailed out a little further, you could get more fish. He said, well, why would I want to do that? He said, well, if you get more fish, then you could begin to sell those fish. And if you sell those fish, you could get better nets. And with better nets, you could catch more fish. And then you could sell those fish and make a profit, and you could start getting more boats. And with more boats and better nets, you can get even more fish. And then with more nets and more boats, you could begin to hire people, and you could have a whole staff around you, and then you could even get more fish and more boats and more people and more nets. Eventually, you could become rich like me. To which the, the fisherman said, well, then what would I do? He said, well, then you could just sit back and relax. To which the fisherman said, but that's what I'm doing right now. Money has an interesting way of taking us away from the very things 
that we could just enjoy even now. The things that matter in life. See, the fisherman had a lot of wisdom. And he illustrates well the words that Jesus said to the foolish farmer and all the barns that he built. Uh, Listen to how Jesus comments on this story in verse 22. He says, then turning to his disciples in this situation where this guy asks Jesus to come and mediate in this situation and then tells this story of the foolish farmer, then Jesus, turning to his disciples, said, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you've had enough to eat or enough clothes to wear, For life is more than food, and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For God feeds them. And you are far far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish the little things like that, What's the use about worrying about bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work to make their clothing, and yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautiful as these flowers were. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today, and then these flowers are gone tomorrow, and thrown into the fire, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what you eat. Don't be concerned about what you drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Notice who he addresses that. They dominate the thoughts. They're the only thing that possesses the mind of unbelievers. And that's because they end up becoming the gods of unbelievers and they do this for unbelievers all over the world but your father already knows your needs so seek the kingdom of god above all else and he'll give you everything else you need don't be afraid little flock for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom so sell your possessions and give to those in need this will store up treasure for you in heaven And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure there will be safe so no thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Certainly the the fisherman was wiser than the farmer. But there's actually a better way than both the way of the fisherman and the way of the farmer. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Because in the end, the fisherman and the farmer are both doing the same thing. They're both getting enough, at least in their mind, of what is enough for themselves. And then being satisfied for themselves. The fisherman for the day, the farmer is trying to build and build and build so that in retirement, he can just rest and relax. But it's all for themselves. But what if the fisher and the farmer had Jesus' perspective on material things and wealth and what can be done with it? What if they had a biblical perspective about the holiness of hard work and creativity and creation and community? What if they were to build more boats, build bigger barns, so that they could provide for the community. They could feed people. They could provide jobs. They could help the economic status of others in the community. Instead of, you know, I'll fish enough just for me today and then I'll rest. Or I'm going to build and build and build and build big enough for me so in retirement I can just sit back and relax for myself. What if they thought about how their work could build homes and build communities, and build churches, and build education centers, and build places of recreation, and relieve poverty for others. For Jesus' teaching, following the foolish farmer's story, is not 
a story about not working. That's not the point he's making in the parable. Don't work. There's no point in work. What Jesus is addressing is where the heart is. As he says in his comments on the story after, where your treasure is, where your heart is, is what will end up pursuing or or what will end up shaping you as a person. And so Jesus says something completely radical and says, sell your possessions even and give to those in need. Like the man who built the barns, why don't you sell that stuff off? Give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. Instead of trying to store up treasure for your retirement and build bigger barns, why don't you use that, still work hard, but why don't you use that to build communities? That then is storing up eternal treasures. The purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure there is safe. No thief can steal, no moth can destroy it, because he says wherever your treasure is will be the desires of your heart. Our attitudes towards money show us the desires of our heart. And where our heart desires is where we pursue our worship. I mean, that's ultimately what worship is. It's desire. What do you desire? Being a follower of Jesus, being a Christian, is a desire to know Jesus. To be in relationship with him. It's not about just information about him. It's a desire. It's a hunger. It's a longing to grow and be closer to Jesus. So how do we avoid becoming a foolish farmer? Especially in our culture. Our culture, which is all about building bigger barns, building bigger houses, building bigger crowds, bigger riches, bigger churches, bigger everything. Everything's got to be bigger. How do we counter a culture of greed? How do we counter a culture of hoarding? How do we counter a culture that wraps our status up of who we are and what our worth is as human beings by how much we have. Jesus says we counter it through generosity. By being generous people. People who give. People who bless. In 1974, uh, many Christians made this commitment at the Lausanne Covenant on world evangelism where they said all of us are shocked by the poverty of millions and disturbed by the injustices which it causes those of us who live in affluent circumstances accept our duty to develop a simple lifestyle in order to contribute more generously to both relief and evangelism we commit to a simpler lifestyle for the benefit of others. Even in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, when it talks about fasting, see, even our spiritual disciplines can be turned around for selfish motives. And so sometimes we think about fasting as, okay, God, I want you to give me something. You don't seem to be coming through, and so I'm going to up the level of my prayers through fasting. So if I go on a hunger strike for a while, it's like, arm twisting God's arm and then God's going to say okay you haven't eaten for a number of days I'll give you what you want it's still then using spiritual disciplines for a very selfish me-centered purpose in the Old Testament when it talked about fasting when the prophets talked about fasting they often emphasized it you go without so that that which you go without can then be given to others the fast was a way of blessing others not manipulating god for ourselves. so i'll go maybe without eating for a few days and that money that i save or that food that i would have eaten myself i can now give that to others that's a true fast the prophet said john wesley used to say earn all you can give all you can he modeled this in his own life by setting a certain standard of living for himself And then when he became more popular and a number of his books and things 
uh, started to sell, and he began making two, three, four times the amount that he was making before he made that commitment, he gave all the rest of it away. C.S. Lewis actually did the same thing. He set himself a standard of living, and then uh, he earned his salary as being a teacher, and then all the royalties from books and everything else he did, he just gave it away. Many of these people did that not just to bless their own communities and others, but they did it to protect their own hearts as well. Retirement has led to mental, psychological, and even physical death for millions of people. Sitting back on one's collected wealth is not a life that honors Jesus. The, the late pastor, John Stott, who was instrumental in the Lausanne Covenant, wrote, Retired people are wise to seek an active retirement in which they have opportunities for constructive service, even if it's unpaid. All of us should expect to remain workers all of our lives, so that even after we've retired, we may spend whatever energy we have left in some form of service. And so we could redecorate someone's house. We could help them fix their cars. We could self-educate through classes and going to lectures. We could visit the sick. We could visit the elderly. We could visit people in the prisons. We could work with the mentally and physically disabled. We can tutor. We can volunteer as a handyman or a handywoman. We could babysit. We can pick up people's kids from school. We could become a crossing guard. We could teach ESL classes, teach children how to read. We can volunteer at the local hospital, the school, the community center, the shelter, the library, the club, the church, or sports teams. We all need to develop habits of generosity as acts of worship to make our communities safer and better in more holistic places for people to live and engage in true community. Give generously to your local church. Find at least one other organization that you're passionate about, uh, some parachurch ministry that you could get involved in, you could read about, you could learn about, maybe you could even visit and give generously there. Travel with them. Subscribe to a magazine devoted to third world needs. Make friends with somebody from a developing country so that you know people personally. Get involved in long-term or short-term mission work. Become a global Christian. One of the things that convicted me a, a number of years ago, I was actually was reading John Stott, and he was talking about a lot of the lack of education for pastors and churches in a lot of places in the world, is what actually had me pursue a doctorate in preaching where I go now and places like Africa and Brazil and teach courses there and educate pastors. But one of the things that really convicted me the first time I went to Africa is I was at the, the, the Cameroon Baptist Seminary and I was teaching a class there and I walked into the library and I was trying to find out what some of the resources were for the students to use and I recognized that my personal library was better than their library for the ent their entire seminary of like four, 400 students. And I just thought, how, how is this even possible? I've got a personal library that has got better and more resources in it than a, than a seminary library for hundreds of students. And so from that experience, I ended up really downsizing my library. I sent tons of my books through different uh, means, through White Cross and some different supplies like that, uh, to the library in the Cameroon. And I began getting involved in different ministries that actually support local pastors in places like Africa to help build them a library. A lot of them don't have any books, don't have any resources. I have a friend who became a Christian and was a owner of an insurance company in Edmonton. And after he became a Christian... He got heavily involved in water 
purification in places like Africa. We did a number of missions trips together, and he, he, I came to his business, the insurance company that he had. He asked me to pray over all of his employees, his whole business, which was kind of like weird for some of the people because most of them weren't Christians, because he said, from now on, most of the profit of this company is going to go toward resourcing and building wells and helping people have pure water in places around Africa. And he just dedicated, that was his business was all about. We did a number of trips together. I mean, when people get excited about Jesus, it doesn't mean they work less hard. But it means they have a totally different focus for why they're working and what matters. You can downsize. You can give away your profits. You can use your bonuses and extra overtime play, pay to help others. You could even do the very basic thing of paying for the meal of the person at Tim Hortons when you're in the drive thru Actually, I had that happen to me just the other day, so I have to pay it back because I was at a, I think it was Walmart or somewhere, and I put all my groceries through, and the person at the till forgot a bunch of groceries. They thought it was the other person's groceries, and so I paid, and then I was like, oh, those are all mine, and the next person in line said, oh, just put them through all on my bill. I was like, seriously? He's like, yep, I'm, I'll pay for them for you. So this guy just randomly just paid for a bunch of my groceries. So I promised him that I would do this for somebody else, so I got to keep that promise now, especially because I publicly made it now. Why do we hoard? Why do we build bigger and bigger barns for ourselves? Jesus addresses what's the underlying issue in all of this. It's because we are people with anxiety. We worry. Isn't that exactly where Jesus goes? He tells the story, and then right after he tells the story, he gives this whole little diatribe on worry. He says, don't worry. But we worry, and when worry and anxiety drives us, we try to medicate our worry by building bigger barns. Thinking that that is what is going to make things all right. But we all know how quickly a barn can burn down. Sadly, through much of what we're seeing in the news with all of the increased wildfires. In this wildfire season, we see again and again and again how things burn down so quickly. We can't put our security in barns. And yet, I have never talked to a person who has been a generous, giving person that has ever said to me, you know what, Pastor Steph, I just so regret it. I just look back at my life and I just so regret how generous I've been. Never had anybody ever say that to me. But I've certainly had people say it the other way. Especially as they see their family splitting and dividing and fighting over the inheritance. And they say, what have I done? At the heart of the Christian faith is giving. Because at the heart of the Christian faith is a God who gives. God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus. Giving is what it's all about. God is a God who gives. God is a God who forgives. So because God has given to us, and because God has forgiven us, when we are changed by this God, we are people who give, and we are people who forgive. And how we handle our money shows a lot about what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life. As Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. A person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. But wait a minute, you might be asking at the conclusion of this message. 
wait a minute, what, what, what happened to the guy that was asking Jesus about the inheritance issue between him and his brother? Whatever happened to him? Did he get his brother to split it with him? But wasn't he asking something that was just right and true? Let's even give it to him and say he was. But here's the catch with everything that Jesus says in reply. Sometimes even getting what is right and just is not beneficial. Let me just say that a second time because that takes some time to digest. Sometimes even getting what's right and just is not always beneficial. Through the parable and the things that Jesus said after the parable, Jesus may be saying to this guy, you're better off to just let your brother have the whole thing. Because at least you will be free. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes we don't even know what's best for us. The requests, the things that we come to you with and say, Jesus, do this, heal this, fix this situation. Lord, sometimes the very things that we ask are things that even if they're right can harm us. And you know better, you know the deeper things, you know the things that impact our heart. And so, Lord, I pray that we will be people that will reflect and even want to go beyond what is just right, but they, we will be a people of wisdom. Lord, change our hearts. May we have the right attitude towards our material blessings. May we use them and not let them use us. May we use them to serve you and to serve others. May we be a people that are generous just as you and your character, God, is a generous God. Amen.